The First World War had enormous and long-lasting effects on the Newfoundland economy. In the short term, there was prosperity, triggered by wartime spending and a suddenly booming fishery. But that was followed by years of debilitating debt. Debt that was largely brought on by the staggering costs of raising and maintaining the Newfoundland Regiment. When war broke out on August 4, 1914, Newfoundland's economy was already in a weakened condition. Its largest industry was the cod fishery, but it was struggling. Increased competition from Norwegian and French fishers had cut deeply into profits and siphoned off important buyers in the Mediterranean. By 1914, Newfoundland's traditional European markets had been largely replaced by less profitable ones in the Caribbean and Brazil. The Dominion suffered a series of deficits and entered the war with a national debt of $30.5 million. It was a heavy burden for a small population of only about 250,000 people. The financial situation grew even worse during the first year of hostilities. As the world adjusted to the uncertainties of war, trade slowed and there were even fewer buyers for Newfoundland salt fish. In June of 1915, the government reported a deficit of $750,000. But then things quickly changed in Newfoundland's favor. Wartime pressures forced European countries like France and Norway to scale back their fisheries. This gave Newfoundland greater access to lucrative markets in Spain, Portugal, Italy and Greece. Catch rates remained strong throughout the war and Britain's Royal Navy safeguarded the shipping lanes that allowed exports to flow from Newfoundland to Europe. Growing wartime demand for fish also drove up prices. Salt cod roughly doubled in value during the war and cod oil tripled. In the summer of July 1916, the average price of cod oil of the commoner rotted quality was $130 per tonne. Prior to this period, it is doubtful if the munitions experts had recognized the value of this fish product in the making of explosives, but it is evident that during that year, its use as an essential was discovered. The cry from France for munitions, munitions, and still more munitions could not go long unheeded, and a remarkable speed up at once took place in the United Kingdom, where every other industry was subordinated to the making of shells and their explosives. The demand for cod oil was a corollary of this, and prices began to move up. So rapidly did this demand mature that prices advanced in leaps and bounds until in November 1918, but a few days prior to the signing of the armistice, the hitherto unheard of or undreamed of sum of $400 per ton was being paid in the local market. Other industries also prospered. The Bell Island Mines found a good customer in Canada which needed a steady supply of iron ore to manufacture weapons and ammunition. Across the Atlantic, Britain imported large quantities of lumber from Newfoundland and Labrador to build wooden frames in its own mines. All of this was a boon to the Newfoundland economy. The annual value of exports almost tripled during the war, jumping from 13 million in the 1914 to 1915 fiscal year to 36 million in the 1918 to 1919 fiscal year. The government reported its first surplus in years in 1916, and it continued to do so until hostilities ended. Jobs became plentiful and wages were high. Wartime inflation drove up the cost of some imports, like flour and coal, but low unemployment made this a minor problem. Evidence of the newfound material prosperity was everywhere. Growing numbers of door-to-door -door salesmen visited outport communities, and cars became increasingly common on the streets of St. John's. But there was a problem. The war had raised local standards of living to artificially high levels. Many people had grown accustomed to a lifestyle that they would not be able to maintain if trade and industry returned to pre-war levels. Worse, the Dominion's newfound air of affluence concealed the fact that it was spending far too much on the war and sinking into heavy debt. Much of its spending was devoted to the recruiting, training, and equipping of local troops for service overseas. By the end of the war, it had enrolled about 6,000 men in the Newfoundland Regiment, 2,000 in the Royal Naval Reserve, 
and 500 in the Newfoundland Forestry Corps. Maintaining these forces cost a fortune, and most expensive of all was the Newfoundland Regiment. To meet its wartime commitments, the government had to borrow heavily from lenders in London and New York. It accepted $13.4 million in war loans and would eventually have to pay another $5 million in interest. Soldier pensions also cost the government another $16 million. As long as trade and industry flourished, Newfoundland could meet its financial obligations without serious difficulty. But after peace was restored on November 11, 1918, some people began to worry that the economy was on the verge of a downturn. Among them was the politician John Curry, who voiced his concerns in the House of Assembly. We may have large fisheries, but we are not likely to have the same prices. We cannot yet say what the price will be, but we know it will not be anything equal to what it was last year. I know there is likely to be a reduction in the price of certain commodities, and that will mean that the revenue of the country will come down. We have had, this past year, the largest revenue that we are likely to have for many years until we get a very much larger population. In the meantime, we are going on increasing our expenditures. We still have an annual expenditure of seven and a half millions when we start paying the annual pensions to our soldiers and the interest on our war debt. And the most we can hope for, so far as I can see, is a revenue far short of that. Unless, of course, we make up our minds to largely increase our tax on our people. I, for one, cannot help looking into the future with some dismay. Fish prices did fall after the war. Newfoundland's major rivals returned to the industry and markets became quickly glutted with cod. By 1922, salt fish was worth less than half what it was in 1918. Compounding the problem was a global economic recession that developed in the early 1920s. Foreign currencies dipped in value and international trade slowed. The market for salt fish contracted even further and Newfoundland watched its profits evaporate. The government reported a deficit in 1921, followed by 14 more over the next 15 years. It had to borrow heavily to pay down its loans and to provide the most essential of public services. Shrinking profits forced companies to lay off workers and unemployment became another problem. By the time the worldwide Great Depression broke out in 1929, Newfoundland's public debt had ballooned to $80 million. Interest payments alone devoured more than 40% of the annual income. The situation was unsustainable, and Newfoundland turned to Britain for help. Assistance was offered, but it came at a tremendous cost. Britain wanted greater political control over Newfoundland to safeguard its investment. Newfoundland would have to replace its elected government with one that was appointed by Britain. The new Commission of Government was sworn in on February 16, 1934. It remained in power until Newfoundland and Labrador joined Canada in 1949. 